Okay. Proverbs 22. Let's look at this together. I just like to read through the proverb just to give us some sound footing for life. 22.1. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. The rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. You know, the Bible says that a lot of times, doesn't it? About when God looks down, he really does not give a care for what's in bank accounts. At the end, he talks about the rich and hell, both can wind up, or rich and poor, both can wind up in hell. Three, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. That's a prosperity verse, isn't it? Riches and honor and life. And I'm sure those riches are riches that don't perish, riches that don't fly away. By humility and fear of the Lord. That's a good combination. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Thorns and snares. Yeah. Here's a verse for me after you heard my kids scream in the whole um, evening service. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. In our Godly Home series, we said that's a promise. The promise in scripture isn't it train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it i think it's really true and you say well logan what about the people who they they did all the right things but the kids still ended up wrong well i think there's i think in those situations there was some hypocrisy somewhere right you talked a good game but you didn't necessarily live it as a parent or there was leaven somewhere Right? You were trying to influence your kids one way, but you brought in all these other worldly influences through whatever, through education or other churches or just relatives. And I think that trains your kids too. I don't think, I think the Bible is really practical. In fact, that's our verse over there in Revelation. The Bible is true and faithful. I take some of these things really literally. And I think, I think we're supposed to. I think for us to doubt it, wait, that verse can't be true because I knew a man who, like, my, like, I'll, like I'll just say my father. My father, he raised us all according to the Word of God, but I'll be honest, some people are now walking in their Bibles and some aren't in my family. So, what happened? I'm not going to speculate there, but something went wrong somewhere. Um, look at 7. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Yeah, I... I believe that too. I, for our church, that's why I'm interested in, in our church uh, decisions. Look at eight. He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall fail. We'll see anger here a couple times in this chapter. He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. Bountiful, I think you're ready to give bountifully. You're ready to help other people out. And you'll be blessed. 10. Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. You hate to lose anybody in life, but if sometimes you have a scorner in life and you get rid of that scorner, it can sometimes be a, a good move. He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. I like 11. You know that leaders, I've noticed it in life, leaders sometimes can value believers more than just the world does. Because leaders, if you're in any sort of leadership position, you want people under you who are worth something, right? And so I think that verses like that tell me that Christians can be okay, right? Just like Joseph, this stranger in Egypt, he was okay because the Pharaoh, that wicked man, he saw value in Joseph. And that's how Christians, I think, have to live. We have to be honest and hardworking and the workplace I'm mainly talking about to bring value to some company that they're not going to fire us because of our old-fashioned beliefs. We preached some of those old-fashioned beliefs on Sunday, didn't we? Pray for us. I posted some of those uh, videos online. Had one lady write us all the way from Georgia, thanking us for preaching that Sunday morning sermon. That yeah, is neat. There's still faith in America. It's just hard to find. But that kind of stuff encourages me. Um, she said she's been watching the sermons from Georgia. I don't know much else about her. 
11. He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips the king shall be his friend. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, and he overthroweth the words of the transgressor. The slothful man saith, There is a lion without, I shall be slain in the streets. That's always a good lesson to teach your kids when they start making excuses not to do their work. You sound like this man in Proverbs. There's a lion out there. 14. The mouth of a strange woman is a deep pit. He that is abhorred of the Lord shall fall therein. Here's another parenting verse. 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Yes, spanking is still biblical. Spanking is still needful. It should be done prayerfully and in love, but if you don't do it at all, you hate your child. The Bible tells us. He that loveth his child chasteneth betimes. Yep. We've covered that in our Family uh, Godly Home series. It's important. And then one of the conclusions we drew, remember, in our Godly Home series, just to recap, is that don't give up on something. When God says it works, it works. Don't put a time stamp on it. We said that about spanking. Don't just give up because you didn't see any sort of change in a child's behavior in a couple weeks. <laughs> Over the span of his youth, it teaches a lesson of discipline and of consequences, I believe. So don't neglect it or they won't know that lesson of discipline and consequences. Um, I think we see that in America today. A generation, I'll bet you this generation was probably the least spanked of any American generation. I'll bet. I don't have, I think so, yeah. I don't have any evidence, but it sure looks like it now <laughs> with the results. I believe that's a principle for a lot of things. Don't give up on God's promise. Keep doing it. Keep doing it, and you'll see God's blessing in the long run. 16, he that oppresseth the poor to increase his riches, and he that giveth to the rich shall surely come to want. Bow down thine ear, and hear the words of the wise, and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. Yeah, that's good. Listen, if you hear wisdom somewhere, get closer to it. For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. They shall withal be fitted in thy lips. I like that picture, don't you? You hear wisdom spoken somewhere, you bow your ear down to it closer, and the result is, then it starts shaping the words of your own lips. It's, it helps us know how to speak. And the same could be said on the flip side, right? Bow down your ears to foolish talking, foolish people, and then pretty soon you'll find yourself saying some pretty foolish things. And that's called leaven. 19. That thy trust may be in the Lord. I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. Have not I written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge, <clears throat> that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. We'll talk about the truth in Revelation here in a second. 22. Rob not the poor because he is poor, neither press the afflicted in the gate. That is a pretty wicked heart when you are afflicting the poor. You've seen that in different centuries. Now, I think our affliction of the poor is not so much in starving the poor. It's not so much in, uh, I don't know, smiting the poor. It's in debilitating the poor so they don't have a good job and they are dependent upon what the government will supply. And that's where they stay, right? It's actually not very loving for the poor. Be better to give them something that they can uh, work on and fulfill on their own and grow on their own. 23, for the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoil them. Make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man thou shalt not go. It's a good verse, isn't it? And why? 25 says, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. Interesting, isn't it? Sometimes you think, I'm not going to go with an angry person because they're going to be hurtful, they're going to be mean to me, or they're going to you know, just be, bring drama to my life. Well, the real warning here is you're going to learn some of the same traits. <laughs> you hang out with someone who can't control their spirit and they're just angry and frustrated and bitter. You hang around with them too long, you'll get some of those same traits yourself. Be not thou one of them that strike hands or of them that are sureties for debts. If thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. 
Our, our nation today needs that, don't we? With all the statues coming down, all these historical statues. Sometimes they, sometimes they pull down the statues of the people who are in the Union, right? Who helped fight for the cause of slavery. And they pull some of those down. It's removing all the landmarks. All of them can just teach you something about history, right? Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. We saw that earlier. We should raise our youth to be diligent, hardworking, honest people. But not just stop there. <laughs> they need the salvation. They need the Holy Spirit. So that work never becomes their life. Work is always just that thing that they do well. And then their real life is God's work. Let's go to our, our chapter now, Revelation 22. I invite any comments from Proverbs 22. Anything you saw that you wanted to talk about that I skipped over? No. All right, let's go to Revelation 22. I can do that offer now because Mr. Aiken's not here and I can skate by quick enough. <laughs> Don't tell him I said that. <laughs> no, I like his comments. He's got some good stuff. Revelation 22. Darwin and Alan, they're not just out getting a hamburger somewhere, are they? <laughs> they're having their own Bible study. I get it. I get it. I get it. I've had this before. <laughs> Revelation 22. Um, it, the start of this chapter here picks up where we left off before describing this new Jerusalem, this eternal state, where we're going to live, this paradise. And then at the end of chapter 22 is kind of the sign-off to the whole Bible neat chapter and i have some follow-up chapters so i'll move somewhat swiftly i hope revelation 22 verse 1 and he showed me a pure river of water of life clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of god and of the lamb and in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations I, I'm not ready to speak deep on this, but you see some neat things about heaven, this new Jerusalem here. You see, uh, well, one, you see that there's a river, a water of life, right? A river of life. There's also the tree of life um, in this picture. That shows life's pretty full, right? I think it shows that we're, we are living a whole kind of different kind of life, full life that we didn't have here on earth. No curse in heaven, and this fruit bear 12 manner of fruits and yielded a fruit every month. I don't know if that's metaphorical, but if you just take it literally, it sounds like there is both time, right? You have fruit every month. So it sounds like, you know, it's for eternity, but there's still something documenting intervals. And it also looks like there are different kinds of fruit. I don't know anything to say about that other than that's kind of interesting. We do know in heaven it sounds like we're going to eat and drink still because Jesus said that he would um, not drink of the cup until he comes uh, later on. So I don't know. I don't know what heaven looks like. This is kind of a glimpse. Three, and there should be no more curse. That's what I just said. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him. Verse three, you see that there's a service of God for eternity. And it's heaven. So this is going to be service we are enjoying doing. I don't think this is going to be quite, you know, working on jet boats or at schools and stuff like that or cell phone companies. It won't be the same. It'll be a different kind of work. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. It says uh, we're going to see his face. Right? In our carnal bodies right now here on earth, we can't look on, on his face without dying um, on the face of God. Here we have this close relationship where he's talking to us and we can see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. It's funny that our name, I think that just kind of shows a complete devotion to God. Like he bought us, we're his, we have a name in our foreheads, um, devotion to God. But who tries to do that? Who tries to put his name in people's foreheads? The Antichrist, at least the number, right? To worship the beast. Yeah, I think he knows his Bible, and he's trying to make himself God, which is very much the case. We know that to be true. Verse 5, And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Remember, this is John trying to do his best to describe 
supernatural things, celestial things. So he sees no darkness there. He sees this God being the light. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. There's that phrase, faithful and true, that I like. Seven, behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. In this final chapter, the Lord sees fit to tell us three times that he comes quickly. You'll see it here, verse 12, and then you'll see it in verse 20. It leads believers and Bible students to think that, that there's an imminent return of the Lord. He could come back at any moment, right? I think that's what the phrase is telling us. Uh, it could, for us, it certainly could be soon, but more than that, it's supposed, we're supposed to live our life as if it's imminent. At any moment, we could turn the page and this could be um, what we're looking at. It's a good way to live life. Even if you end up dying and the Lord never came back, he will have rewarded you for living every day as if the next day you're going to see him and answer to him and see his face. It's a good way to live. Yeah, if you, live, if you think, no, he'll never come back, then you might become just idle, right? Not serving the way we ought to serve. Eight, and I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. These things are so wonderful, these sights of heaven, that again, remember we've heard John do this before, again, John falls down to worship at the feet of the angel. He's done it before. And every time the angel rebukes him, nine, then saith he unto me, see thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant. The angel always rebukes. And watch what this angel says. It gives you a good idea of what are angels. For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. The angel says he's right with us. The angels, I don't, they are supernatural, and they're in a different dimension than us, but actually they're created beings. God creates them, and I believe they have, they have rules. They have do's and don'ts. I believe they have a free will. I believe you saw that with the fall of Satan. There's different power among angels, with Michael the archangel. Uh, we see that in the book of Revelation. We might, maybe one day we'll do a whole study on angels. And the fact that it does look like you have an angel who's supposed to watch out for you, at least uh, you're designated um, for their charge. It's neat to think about. But how the angels view it, they view Christians, they view saints as if we're on the same team. Right? We're fellow servants of God, doing God's work. That's why tonight I want to tell you all, you all are angels. Just kidding. I'm not good at sl slipping in flattery, am I? It just doesn't sound real, does it? I need to practice that. Ten. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the book of this prophecy, for the time is at hand. So don't seal it. Keep this prophecy open, because now is the time we should have the Bible open. Now is the time we should be preaching these things and telling people of these things. 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. I commented on that before, and I still believe it's, it's exactly the way that we commented before. As if this is your state going into eternity, and you remain in that state. If you never had your sins washed away, you're going to go into eternity filthy and you'll stay filthy. If you've had your sins washed away, you'll be righteous. You'll be holy for all eternity. You'll have that, that name of God in your forehead. You'll serve God. Twelve, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I, I think if we have time, I want to come back to this idea about rewards. If it's in context there, he might simply be talking about you'll either get heaven or hell, and that certainly could be the case. We also know, though, that Christians who serve the Lord can expect rewards. It's a biblical concept. So we'll look at 1 Corinthians 3 if we have time at the end of this. 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Yeah. That's your answer. There is no... We talk about the Big Bang on Sunday. Right, well, where did all that stuff come from, right? And where is all this going? Well, with God, you have the start of the story, you have the end of the story. It's the perfect story. The beginning and the, and the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. 
This could either be talking about obedience to the gospel and getting into that city, or it could be talking about, again, the rewards side of it. Here it sounds like because entering the city, it sounds to me, it's talking about being obedient to the gospel, accepting Christ as your Savior. We've seen that terminology. God doesn't want you to obey, I mean, jumping through a bunch of works and hoops, but God does want you to obey the Bible when it says, repent and believe. He wants that obedience. 15, for without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie, like every chapter of Revelation, it, about every chapter, it gives you that contrast. Here are people in heaven and here are people outside of heaven. And it usually describes them. And here he's just quickly describing before he signs off some of the people that aren't in heaven. Dogs. If actually you're studying the Old Testament, there's some reason to believe it's in, you can look there with me if you want, Deuteronomy 23, um, 17. Look back there if you would. There's some reason to believe that dogs can refer to that uh, sodomy that we talked about on Sunday. It's not a big point for tonight, but I just thought I'd mention it to you. Um, Deuteronomy 23 and verse 17 describes them in this fashion. 23.17 says, Thou shalt not pervert the judgment of a stranger, nor of the fatherless, nor take it... No, I'm going to read the wrong chapter. That's 24, sorry. 23.17. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the, of the sons of Israel. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore, or the price of a dog, into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow, for even both these are abomination to the Lord thy God. Here's one of those things where you see an Old Testament rule and you're asking, well, does God smile favorably upon those kinds of lifestyles now? No, He doesn't because we have Romans 1 and everything else in the New Testament. And plus here we see some correlation with Revelation chapter 22. Talking about these are the ones without. 15. Let's go back to Revelation 22, 15. For without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie... These people don't go to heaven. As I preached on Sunday, these things are important to know because then you know who, who needs the Lord really clearly in these lifestyles. And I mean that. When I preach on Sunday that you preach a sermon like that because you want people to hear the truth and get saved, I mean it. Um, and I do believe we're doing a disservice when we never name the sin. At the end there it says, And whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. A lot of people go to hell for simply that reason. They make up lies to not believe this book, right? They make up lies to believe something else. And they love lies that tell them not to believe this book, right? There are some really giddy people about finding evolution, right? I talk about that in college, right? Well, yeah, there's some, there's some ill-intentioned professors, but there are also many a college student looking for a reason to stop believing in God and this Bible. It kind of goes both ways. I think it's a key verse. People make lies. People are also looking for lies, and it's all damning people to hell. Let's go 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify. Oh, I should say one more thing about verse 15. Loveth lies. That is a, a big part of why some churches grow, right? If they're churches that are good at speaking lies, a lot of people are going to love that church. Right? If, if you can tell me why it's okay to stay in my sin, then uh, this is the place for me. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Look at 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the, church, in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Yeah. Jesus describes himself. He also says this is what would be testified in the churches. 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. When I read 17 in my study, I was interested. I was... It was neat to note that who was giving this, this invitation? Jesus spoke in verse 16. We see this picture of heaven. But look at 17 says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. The Spirit is the Holy Spirit inviting people to believe the gospel, right? But that bride is the church, right? That's us. We are the ones supposed to be issuing this invitation per Brett's sermon on uh, Sunday night. We are going out issuing this invitation, right? 
It should be really clear on why you need to accept this invitation for the Sunday morning sermon, but this is us. God's invitation for salvation is done through his servants and through the Holy Spirit. So let him that heareth say, come. Let him that is a thirst come. It's a neat pattern. The Holy Spirit and the church preach it. If you then hear it, hear the truth, and you believe it, then you should start saying, come. And then the people who are athirst, they should come. You can preach a whole sermon around this verse. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Again, you know I'm very anti-Calvinist. It's hard to be a Calvinist and read verse 17, isn't it? It's just saying, everybody, come. Calvinists will say, well, some people can't come. Well, that's a very sad invitation, then, isn't it? <laughs> you guys can come to my birthday party, but I'm not going to tell you how to get there, where it's at, what time it is, what day. <laughs> you don't know anything. But you're, you're welcome to come. That's what the Calvinist believes. Very silly. 18. Wicked, actually. 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Uh, I want to talk about some about um, prophecy before we close our service today. So let's come back to 18. 19, and, and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. You start tampering with God's word, as I'm sorry, some of these new versions do. Taking out 1 John 5, 7, taking out references to the blood, taking out references to the deity of Christ. There is somebody in these translations that God is holding accountable. And when they're making these false translations, God is blotting their name out of the book of life. Done. We should not tamper with God's word. It is, people, there, there are the thousands of translations today. I wish all those people would come back and look at that verse real close before they decide to make the next one. Sandra, stop working on your new translation. Come on. <laughs> the Sandra version. No, it's a real, if the Bible is true, and it is, it says it's true and faithful, that's a real promise, that's a real threat. We shouldn't tamper with God's word. We shouldn't add things to it or take things away. Look at verse 20. He which testifies these things saith, Surely I come quickly. There it is, the third time. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. If you got into a number study, you will see that the number three is, is pretty special. Uh, I don't know what it's all about. But the Trinity, and then you see it throughout the Bible, the number three. There it is, the third time. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. 21. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. He closes again with that reminder of his imminent return. Imminent return. That's the end of the Bible. We've concluded our study, and so we will be now taking solicitations or um, ideas for new books to study. Okay? Hop on pop. We're not going to do that. Uh, no. Plus, you're not allowed to read many more Dr. Seuss books now. <laughs> A lot of them got thrown out, right? <laughs> Okay, no, I want to talk about, I want to keep our next 15 minutes, if you all are up for it, I want to look at prophecy and that idea of, are there any more revelation? What I believe is when John seals it up here, when it's done, and it says don't add anything more to it, I believe that revelation, prophecy is done, complete, right? The naysayers will say, well, Logan, he's just saying don't add to the book of, the book of revelation. That's a theory. I don't believe it's true. It says, any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues. The first time it says, add, it says, add unto these things, which you could take to mean these doctrines, these, right? These things that relate to so many other things in the Bible. Don't add to them, but also that idea of not adding to the word of God, not revealing, not bringing forth more revelation. You see that back in, all the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2. I want to show you just a couple places that say, don't add to this book. This is problematic, right? Because you have prophets in about every cult who are adding more revelation. I think we have everything we need in these 66 books of the Bible. I know we have everything we need. Look at, it says we're truly furnished. Look at Deuteronomy 4. Where did I leave off? 
Well, there's my note. 4, verse 2. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Okay, so this talks about God gives words, God gives commandments. We're not supposed to add to it or diminish from it, right? Is God just talking about the book of Deuteronomy? I don't think so, right? You're usually talking about His commandments. And all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So we need to be very careful if we think that revelation can happen. Um, I think it doesn't. Why else is it problematic that revelation might happen? <laughs> Who are you going to believe? Some man's going to stand up and prophesy something, right? And how you can test these things, one, you know your Bible, you know that we don't need any more revelation, you know it's not commanded, you know there's curse if you do, and then two, you compare Scripture with Scripture, right? So if some prophet is preaching something that contradicts the Bible, well, it doesn't make any sense. God will never contradict himself. Look over here at another verse, please look at... Uh, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. Do we need any more revelation after the book of Revelations? We'll go to 1 Corinthians in a second, but look at Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. Every word of God is pure. There's that true and faithful. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Add not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Sounds a little bit like our two other verses we just read. We're not to add to God's word. It says it here in these books that I think God knew, God, of course God knew, that mankind would be inclined to start writing his own. Start writing his own. By the way, I found a couple of golden tablets in my backyard yesterday. And I'm not saying anything about them, but... They had some inscription on them. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Not pretty soon. No, I won't make that joke about wives. That gets pretty nasty real fast. Yeah. Those prophets took people's wives. It wasn't really a good thing. Okay. Let's look at, uh, please look at 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. I think going from Revelation and this idea about does Revelation continue, brings up this needful passage in 1 Corinthians 13. I think our, our, our two missing gentlemen would have enjoyed this look. So, oh well, we'll look at it again sometime. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 8, I want to start. This chapter, of course, it, it defines what charity is, so it's an important chapter for that reason. But the last half of this chapter, I think, is of the utmost importance for understanding tongues and prophecy. And do we still do it or not? Of course, the whole book speaks of it, but let's look right here. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. We know this godly love and this love of God and this doing of His commandments, it never fails. It's always going to be important, okay? But at some point in time, the Bible says that prophecies, they will fail. So at some point in time, prophecies done. At some point in time, it says also that the tongues will cease, okay? So it behooves us as students of the Word of God to ask, when did they stop? On the tongues front, which I'm not coming to preach a sermon against tongues, but you know I do not believe it for this age at all. And one reason is a verse like this, and we'll go down further, but a verse like this plus the fact that tongues dropped off the face of the map for thousands of years, and they didn't pop up again until Azusa Street Mission in California, right? When the modern-day Pentecostal movement was born. That's when they started speaking tongues again. But all your, your Christians, your Anabaptists, your Donatists, everybody over the years, no one spoke in tongues. They all just believed it was a thing that was done away with in the book of Acts. Different studies, tongues. And maybe we'll do that sometime. Right now I want to talk about Revelation. Look at verse 9. It says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Paul, at the time of writing to this church in Corinth, he says, we know in part. That means we know some, right? A part of what we're supposed to know. And we prophesy a part of what we're supposed to know. It says, but Tendon says, but, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. It does use that, that word, that, 
Some people say that the thing that's going to come, okay, so, okay, so let's read in context again. When that which is perfect has come, okay? So when something perfect comes, then these things of that we have in part, these revelations that we know in part, these prophecies in part, when the perfect thing comes, then that's done. So what's the perfect thing? Some people will say Christ is perfect, right? So Christ at his second coming, Christ comes, and then prophecy is done because the perfect Christ has come. Uh, but if that's what it means, it's sure written kind of a funny way, isn't it? Right? For one, it's saying we know in part, and we prophesy in part. When that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So it's like we have half of something, and when we get the rest of it, then we're, it'll be passed away. Right? And we don't need it anymore. Sounds like prophecy to me. Prophecy, there's still revelation to come, right? But also that word that, but when that, which is perfect, has come. It's an inanimate object. You'll, you'll, I don't think you'll see in Scripture, you maybe will find something somewhere, who knows, in the book of Job or something. But primarily when it talks about Christ coming, it will say when He comes, when Christ comes, when the Lord comes, right? If it was really speaking of the Lord, I don't think it would have called him a that. You don't see it in Scripture. At least I, I can't name too many places. That's what I believe. I believe this passage is talking about when that which is perfect has come and that which is in part should be done away with. I believe that the perfect thing is the Word of God. When the Word of God is finished, when John signs off in the book of Revelation and says, hey, don't add anymore, I believe that's it. It's perfect. And then we trust to God to gather his 66 books together and, and say, these are the canonized scriptures. This is it. There's nothing more. And what else could we need, by the way? You've got John taking us all the way in, into the tribulation period, into the kingdom age, into the new world, new heavens and new earth, right? And how we're living there. What else do we need for revelation? I think we've got the rest of the part, it seems to me. What's that? Yeah. James 1 23. Yeah, you're right. Let's read down through all the way to that spot. 11 says, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. If you read the book of 1 Corinthians, it's a whole rebuke to the carnal church. And he's talking about how um, you'll see across the page in 14 hits his rebuke against tongues. Look at, um, we don't need to go there, but we'll cover it later on. But he's rebuking them about the use of tongues, and he calls tongues a childish thing. Wants us to get over these gifts that were for a time, and instead just seek Scripture. He calls you know, people babes if they don't know the Scripture, right? To grow in the Lord is to know the Scriptures. I thought as a child, but when I came a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly to breath point, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. And now by the faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. It's an important passage. Well, I think it gives us evidence about is there a place for prophecy? Is there a place for tongues? And I say no. And so you say, Logan, when there's a lot of churches that believe in tongues, what are they doing? What, what kind of language is that? Uh, and what are they doing with prophecy? What are, are those things true or not? One, I think their prophecies are all failing. And two, I think their tongues are nothing but um, garbly gook or demonic speech. Because what were tongues in the Bible? Tongues and acts were real languages. Everyone heard as if it was in their own tongue. Real languages, right? So churches today, including in our valley, they'll get off on tongues and they're off scripturally. And not only that, it becomes, in most tongue-speaking churches, tongues is like one of the big deals, right? You're going to speak in tongues and it's like our centerpiece when we know that's not what it's supposed to be. They always talk about the Holy Spirit, right? Using tongues. Well, one thing we know about the Holy Spirit is it won't speak of itself. The Holy Spirit isn't into drawing attention to itself. The Holy Spirit is into glorifying Christ. You do this through the Word of God. You're going to say something, Brett? You look poised. Oh, you weren't? Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. Okay. Does that 
Not everybody interprets that chapter that way. But is that, um, at least the way I present it, does it make some sense to you? Make some sense? Yeah. It's a longer study. Maybe one day we'll look at the charismatic movement and tongues and prophecy just all at one time, but different study. With our last five minutes, let's get to this other thing that I mentioned. 1 Corinthians 3, the rewards, gain and loss of rewards. Yeah, I think it's a shame people waste their time looking at tongues so long. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, um, let's read the start here because it, it ties to what we said. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, and hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. This is what we have in our churches. They'll get caught up on some of these extra-biblical things, anti-biblical things, and they won't grow in sound doctrines we're supposed to. Three, for ye are not, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Let's read verse 5, thinking about how we gain and lose rewards. 5. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. There's that, that fellow servants with the Holy Spirit. Just preaching the gospel. 6. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Thus, there's the first mention of rewards. But you see, our labor is that. It's spiritual labor. It's sharing the gospel. It's planting seeds for salvation. It's watering other seeds that have already been planted. And we're supposed to be careful how we build thereon. And then God gives the increase. Doesn't the Bible kind of just break it down in shoe leather? These things are true and faithful. So when you tell me that you've witnessed to somebody, amen, that's this Bible, right? And someone follows up with them, they're watering. That's how life is supposed to play out. A busy week, a busy month, a busy year of planting and watering just as you would in your own garden. Nine, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. By the way, these verses also tell me what is ministry number one. It is about the gospel. It's not these other side things we, we think we call ministry if they're nothing to do with scripture. For we labor together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. For if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, and because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. When we get to heaven, we're going to be dropping our works right here on this heavenly scale. Um or oven, I should say. And some of what we've done is just going to plain burn up. Some of what we thought was important. Well, God, you know, I, I work for Habitat for Humanity for two years. And if you weren't sharing the gospel, I mean, it's, not, it's kind of the wood hay stubble, even as nice as it is. But the gospel is what lasts here, right? Be a nice neighbor. Be a, a good citizen. But you want to know the works that last are eternal things. Wood, hay, and stubble. I think there's many, many people are going to have a mound of wood, hay, and stubble that on this earth might have looked pretty impressive. But in heaven, God's going to say, that didn't lead a person to the Lord. That didn't cause one person to look at my word. Actually, what it did, it caused a lot of people to look at you. And yeah, you got that, you got that volunteer of the year award about 10 times, but they still didn't learn about Jesus Christ. <laughs> Right? I think we'll see a lot of this. And we can be true in our own lives. We can have these things we really think are important, and we'll lay them up there, and they're going to burn up. So what's the mantra we should live by? Make sure our words and our lives are focused on this Bible. And if we're going to share something with somebody, make sure it's this Bible. Right? Yeah, mow their lawn, but slip in a gospel track somewhere. That's, 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 those are the precious things that will last. 14, if any man's work abide... 
which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. When God comes back and when they see that heavenly scene, that new Jerusalem, we're all saved, praise the Lord, but some of us are going to be walking around with that line in our minds. We'll be saved, uh, yet so as by fire. All right, what we got saved from was hell, okay? But when we show up, we're a little bit empty-handed because we didn't serve the Lord the way we're supposed to be. I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> I want to have something to show my master for all he's done for me. Think about that. You get another picture of heaven there, though, don't you? You think we're all just in heaven and um, we're all saved and it's all, we're all, we're all equally saved and we're all equally happy, I'm sure, but there's still going to be this, some with rewards and some without. It's scriptural here, it's scriptural in Revelation. Okay, uh, 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Boy, that preaches a lesson, doesn't it? When God tells us, be holy, for I am holy, speaking to the Christian, I, we preached it before, but if, you, if you're a Christian, if you're naming Christ, then you have even more reason to get out of sin than you ever did before. Because God holds you to a higher standard because now you're a temple of God, right? God dwelling in you, the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. The Holy Spirit can be very vexed with our sinful lives. The, the language there can't be any stiffer. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. How do you defile the temple? It's lifestyle sins. It's living in sins, living in, living in drunkenness, living in fornication, living in adultery, living in, living in sinful lifestyles. You don't get out of that sin. You don't confess it, forsake it. You stay in it. Your father is not happy. It says here it's a, it's a reason for God to uh, take you off the field. 18. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Yeah. Yep. Less, we need to be less perceived as the smart person in this world and just more with our nose in the scriptures. More walking out of this world than into it. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. I think it follows up this whole thing about works with these thoughts about our own wisdom, because I think they get in the way of us doing what God wants us to do. If we think we're so smart, we'll never ask God for, well, no, what am I really supposed to be? Because I know I'm supposed to be the smart person who makes all kinds of money and successful, right? And, and everybody loves me. That's what I know. But what do you want me to be? Um, God may tell us to be something else. Low in this world, but high in heaven. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are... Uh, Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And you're Christ, and Christ is God's. The chapter begins with that argument over who they're a follower of, as if that was some sort of badge that they could put or some sort of feather in their cap that they're either for Paul or Apollos. God here at the end brings it back to, are you a follower of Christ? you are Christ. Watch the sin in your life. Water, plant, and I'll give the increase. It's a good chapter. Maybe I covered two chapters in 1 Corinthians. Maybe we should go to 1 Corinthians. I don't know. Pray for me. Let's pray about what chapters we go to next. Um, I left no time for questions. Any questions, though? Pat? Pretty good chapters, right? They weren't... I wasn't super depressing, was I, Roberta? Not super depressing? Oh, okay, good. The Bible's fun, right? Okay, let's go ahead and pray then. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, that it's complete and it's perfect, and we don't need some uh, man to stand up today and give us new revelation. We have everything we need. Lord, help us to take it like that, like it is true and faithful, and believe every word, apply every word, live it like it's going to happen, because we know it will.